that uh, actually is not okay. it is now okay lovely um uh, well, well, just wait i think there's people joining at the moment so i don't know if you want to wait a couple of minutes yes please i think we'll give people it's not quite 11 on my computer yet if we can give people maybe till one or two minutes past 11 that would be quite handy of course Mitch, while, while we're yeah. waiting, do you, do you want to just um, tell the people who have joined already about the chat function and the question option, just so they're aware of, of, of it? I mean, I'll, I'll just uh, remind them in a minute, this will be a Q&A, but uh, as the host, do you want to just tell them how it can work? Yeah, so I think anyone who's got any questions uh, or wants to say anything, you can, there's a and a box at the bottom. Um, if you see, just write any questions you've got in there or feel free to pop me over an email, um, mitch at nordens.co.uk and I'm sure I'll get it um, and we can, we can answer any questions that, that you need. But there is a Q&A box at the bottom which, um, which we, can, we can answer anything from. So yeah, um, so Neil, I think you're probably waiting for about 10 more people, um, but they're coming on quickly okay so i'm still showing 11 a.m on my clocks so if perhaps we can um perhaps we can just give it another one minute and then we'll we'll kick it off if that's okay yeah of course i need to whatever you want i'm ready when you are okay i'm looking forward to your questions now it'll be interesting to see how many people are from the um, obviously we've worked we've worked with, with you before at wembley um haven't actually been up to the manchester uh, to the Etihad, but it'd be interesting to know the split of who's from uh, Manchester and who's from Wembley. Yeah, I'll try and uh, work out that information when we've uh, concluded the webinar. Um, I mean, certainly we'd love to have you in Manchester. I don't know if you have any business interests that take you up, up north, but you'd be welcome to go to the Etihad and put on a, a live session. Um, one of the, the lecturers who's, who's logged in today is our programme leader at the Etihad, Ian. Um, for finance and I, I know Ian would, would be grateful to have you up there so we'll follow up on that and see if we can get you into into Manchester yeah no, we've got a few we've got quite a few clients actually in, in Manchester so um, maybe I'll reach out next time next time I'm up or, or next time we're up it'll be, uh, yeah. be interesting yeah we'll, we'll find an excuse for you to get there I'm sure we can <laughs> always love an excuse for Manchester me a absolutely it gets better and better um, I, I think we might as well start the, the proceedings, really. Yeah, um, I, I, first of all, I want to thank everybody who's, who's joined today. I, I'm showing that we've got close to 50 people online at the moment. And um, let, let me tell you, in the current climate, that's a really, really good number. You know, UCFB has been hosting some global summits from New York and Atlanta, and we're matching those figures. So uh, well done to everybody who's logging in this morning. I'm, I'm confident you'll find it useful and um, as Mitch said, for those of you that were on a moment ago, this is an interactive session. Although only Mitch and I can speak and it will be a Q&A, there is a chat box for you to submit a question if it comes up as we're going along. Um, we do have some questions that have already been submitted. Um, let, let me first of all properly introduce Mitch. So um, uh, uh, Norden's Accountancy is uh, a contact of mine that I've had for many years mainly because the founder is a close friend of mine and Mitch is the CEO and, and Mitch is somebody who's come in to help our students at Wembley in the past because he's London based and they've always uh, received him very well. Um, as you can see, just by looking at Mitch, he breaks the mold of stereotype accountants because he's a, a hip, hip young guy, take my word for it. Um, but Mitch is actually also a, a semi-pro footballer. Um, Mitch, can I ask you first of all to just maybe literally in a brief summary, Give us an overview of who you are, what you do, and particularly why you have such an interest in football. Yeah, so, um, well, I used to be a, I play semi-professional now, uh, so I'm still, still in the game. But um, when I was 16, I signed uh, apprentice scholarship forms at Bolton, up north near Manchester. Um, so they ended up making my first team debut at Southend at 18. Um, then I ended up in non-league, from 20 to 21, um, obviously non-leagues part-time. So I ended up getting a job, studied to become an accountant because I loved business and uh, the rest is history. Ended up going through the, there was only two, it was only myself and Mark actually, who, who's the chairman now, Neil, who you know, the founder. Um, and it was two of us at the time and now we've built the company up. There's 
we're one we're top 100 firm in the country um probably about 80th and we've got 70 staff now so it's really good also during that time i set up a football agency and we actually did a big premier league move which was which was really good uh, so that's another interesting football but listen football's my life i still play at semi-pro and we work with a number of clients agents and 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 also sports injury as well and sports science um that you know we still work with them as, as clients who have their own businesses but yeah um that's a I, that's in a nutshell i could go on and on and on and on about um kind of my life in football but it's not where i am now i'm in a, a ceo of nordens and we specialize in helping businesses achieve their goals Okay, I mean, we've been running some uh, webinars with a football agent that have been very, very popular and very successful at offering ASA qualifications. So, again, perhaps that's something we can develop with you in the future. We'll, we'll talk about that. Um, Mitch, I'm going to start by asking you, as a business, how has life changed for you since the lockdown? What adjustments have you, have you had to make, um, particularly with your you know, everyday advising of clients? Well, I think from, from our personal point of view, I mean, we've got 70 people in the office and it's literally an edge of a cliff moment, wasn't it? It was one day everyone was in the office and then the next day it was everyone's working from home. And I think we've been in a fortunate position to, um, as, a, as a firm that we've had disaster recovery in place for probably six to seven years now. But I, I have no idea why we've had it in place, but we just happened to have it in place. So we tested it on the Tuesday before, um, before lockdown. Uh, I think it was the Tuesday and we were literally on lockdown from the Wednesday or Thursday from memory and it was working perfectly. So now everybody's working from home. It's completely, it, it's absolutely insane. I mean, every, you know, rather than doing team meetings in the office, we're doing zoom calls where there's 70 people uh, office zoom calls. We're doing office quizzes to keep the, the keep the team culture there. Um, obviously to go experience it yourself allows us to um, advise clients as well on, on how to do it and not, well, we're actually launching something at the moment, uh, digital transformation, which is, is huge. It's the next big thing. There's a lot of business owners that don't know how to move from, from where they are now to transform digitally. And I think that's, that's where the advice is um, from an actual check from, from what the lockdown's done to businesses. Obviously there's a lot more advice from a financial point of view, but from an actual um, change of working, it's all about how to go digital, I think. And that's where, um, you know, like I said, a lot of businesses didn't have disaster recovery in place. So people have had to bring us in to really help create that for them and, and allow them to work remotely. But it's not just working remotely. You've got to be able to keep the cultures, team culture in place as well, which is tough. Because, um, you know, people find, companies, are find it, companies do find it difficult to keep culture when they're actually in an office. So imagine doing it when everyone's sitting in their living room. It, it's, it's not easy. So it is, it's, it's tough. And I think there's a lot of anxiety and stress in business owners with business owners at the moment. Mitch, I'm going to move straight on to a hot topic. Um, some of the questions I've got to ask you have been submitted by students, some okay. by staff, and yeah. students who are listening in today will have assignments they're writing. So let's stress to them that these are your opinions. However, we're asking you your opinions as the CEO of a top 100 accountancy firm, and therefore you offer primary research to our students. Um, but can you talk about whether you might think it's right and ethical for Premier League clubs in particular to take advantage of the government's furlough scheme? Um, we've had a couple that uh, have announced it and then backtracked because of public pressure. Um, what, what do you think should be happening, particularly Premier League, where allegedly all the money is? I mean, it's a hot topic at the moment, isn't it? The amount of people that have asked me that in the last few days. Um, Firstly, I, it's not legally wrong. I just want to clear that up. You know, the, the, it's there to, um, you know, it's not wrong. The, the government haven't been clear, in my opinion. I think that's where the issue is. Um, but it's not wrong. So if they want to do it, they can do it. I don't believe it's ethical. I think it's completely unethical, if you want my honest opinion. Um, I think Premier League clubs will be key in bringing back the... Um, the economy um, and I will go on to that after but I don't think it's ethical I think with the amount of cash reserves they've got sitting there 
um, I, and also the assets which they can borrow on, I personally think that they should be not using the furlough scheme. But again, I really think that the government haven't been clear and I blame the government for it because they haven't said you can't furlough if you've got X amount of reserves or if you've got, if you can afford it or if you can have X amount of borrowing. So that's my, that's my personal um personal thoughts on it i don't think it's wrong because it's legally not wrong but it's definitely not ethical and i am strongly against it and i'm so happy that uh daniel levy pulled out because i'm a big spurs fan yeah i agree with you i think it hurts people when they see the amount of money paid in transfer fees and maybe agents fees that that they're trying to uh get out of paying some of the lower paid staff. So I think you've hit the nail on the head there. Um, Mitch, do you think that it'll have an impact on key stakeholders in clubs when they see the way the, the Premier League clubs are behaving? Could it have an impact on the stakeholders? Yeah, I think it will. And I think they're probably the reason why that a lot of clubs have backtracked because I think they would have blocked it. Um, I really do. Okay. And, and obviously none of us know yet what, What's going to happen when football will resume if it resumes obviously to complete the season but what do you think might be some of the key changes that will take place on the business side of football especially in the, the again outside of the Premier League the EFL what, what do you see as being the changes moving forward I think the thing is is that nobody knows and I, I, I think it's a tough one because we no one has ever experienced this in our lifetime before um, so you know you, you can it's a tough one to answer but my opinion um, is that well everything's going to go digital, so let's let's know every every business, let alone football club, needs to make um, as many things as possible digital. That's that's what it's going to have to come down to. The world's not going to be the same, and so on. So I think you're going to get um, a, a, <laughs> it's tough. You're going to see a big split, in my opinion. I think you're going to have the EF. Let's talk about the EFL rather than the Premier League, because I think the EFL is easier to work with based on this. There are just like businesses, there are EFL clubs that are set up and run extremely efficiently. There are also uh, EFL clubs that aren't run efficiently. And I think there are non league clubs that are run. When I say non league, I'm talking about the National League, which I would argue that they fall into the EFL effectively as well. Um, that are well run as well and I think you're going to see a really big reshuffle I think there's going to be a huge gap and I think you're going to get clubs that aren't run properly that haven't got reserves and are going to really struggle um, because I think they don't you know they they probably live off they don't have money in the bank they they run off the last pound in the bank and then you've got clubs that are really really liquid that will thrive just like businesses and I think um, I think the clubs that really focus on their academies and engaging with the fans will, will really thrive. And I think you'll see a change. And I think you've got clubs, a really, really good example is Peterborough. Peterborough are a club that um, they buy in players cheap and they sell players for, for a lot of money, or they really focus on their academy. And I think clubs like that have got the opportunity to, who aren't, they're, they're not financially, you know, they're probably not hugely liquid, but they're probably not, they run quite efficiently, clubs like Peterborough. They go under the radar, they survive and they do really well. And I think clubs like that have an opportunity to really push up the leagues based on their uh, based on their scouting. So I think a lot of clubs that have invested in the past over in their academy will pay off now. Um, so I do think there's going to be a big gap that's going to open up, and I do think you're going to get a lot of non-league clubs that are run really efficiently, sort of at the top of the EF, um, like a like a Maidstone. Who you know they. Um, there, there's an opportunity for them to really push up the leagues now. I think you're going to see a reshuffle and a big gap opening up. Uh, I think I think a lot of things, um, you know, what clubs that haven't been engaging with fans as well. I think, you know, you get a lot of selfish clubs that don't engage with fans, the uh, manager, uh, chairman that just say, well, you know, the fans' opinions don't matter. Um, I think that, uh, I think that, you know, they're going to have a problem. They're going to have a problem. Mitch, um, I, I think you are also keeping an eye on the chat box, but it, yeah. it's popped up the fact that Burnley has been highlighted as a club that, that have said that without the right funding coming in, they, they could possibly go to the wall. It will ruin them. Why do you think a, a club like Burnley is being talked about in, that, in those terms at the moment? I mean, firstly, I don't think you can believe everything you hear in the media. Um, I, don't, I don't know um, the issue with Burnley. I don't think any of us know the issue with Burnley. If I'm honest, I think that 
any club can go bankrupt if they haven't got huge financial investment. But it's all about the the running of the club. And I know that if we kind of take it back to to I guess Burnley are a large a large business. If you look at the small and medium businesses, they're in the same position. They have to do their forecast, cash flow forecasting. They will, they will, um, but they every everyone's going to have to borrow apart from people that are extremely liquid, and it all depends on how long this lasts for. So, I don't know is the honest answer because I don't know the full details. And until we were to see cash flow forecasts and accounts and stuff, you won't be able to answer that question. But I can only imagine that every club's in the same position. It's just that a journalist has got hold of Burnley. Mm. it's fair enough I mean do you think that this will force more clubs to have to operate within their financial means because we know that clubs don't um, we've seen what's happened to clubs uh, who've, who've really been hit with financial penalties is, is what's happening now going to force clubs to operate financially within their means do you think I think there's going to be a gap and I think you're, what you're going to have is you're going to have players, uh, clubs like, you know, Manchester United, uh, Manchester City, you know, the, the big top four that have got, they're so liquid. It's unbelievable. And they have, will have the opportunity to spend, spend, spend. I think you'll have clubs like Burnley, like, um, you know, Bournemouth, Brighton in, in the Premier League, West Ham, um, they're, they're down there now. But clubs like that, that will really have to live, they, they, will, they will really have to cut back on their spending. But then it's all relative, isn't it? Because I think prices of players will come down, in my opinion, apart from, you know, the top, top, top world-class players. Um, no one's going to go and spend 80, 90 million on a player unless it's Man, Manchester City, Man U, Liverpool, that are so liquid, um, in my opinion. I, 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 yeah, I do think clubs will have to live within their means. Well, I would say... The, apart from the top four or five. Mitch, I'm going to pick up on what you said about um, non-league clubs, national league clubs. Yeah. Um, I, I'm pleased to say UCFB is an educational partner of, of the National League and we've got a great relationship. We have many students working at uh, many of the, the clubs in the National League. Um, do you think that they should still remain optimistic from an employment point of view, the ones that are graduating this summer? I know, I know people can't predict their finances, but when football bounces back, do you still think that um, the job market will be, you know, buoyant for 21-year-olds, 20-year-olds, you know, the, 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 the cheaper end of the scale, if you don't mind me calling them that? Um, I don't mind you, but I think there's 54 attendees that will mind you calling them that. <laughs> um, I think it's a great opportunity for young um, 2021, 20, 18, 18 to 21. I think technology now is going to be so key. And I think that anyone now growing up um, have been have been brought up with tech. I mean, you know, Neil as an as an old uh, as a as an oldie um, technology. Even I find it a bit tough with technology. And I was kind of, um, you know, I was brought up through the start of when all you know tech became huge. You were in a different era to me. I mean, you see the, you see people now, eighteen, nineteen years old, on technology and you know TikTok and Instagram and everything like that. It's a different world. And I think if you, you know, understand that because you're brought up in that period, and I think businesses will now, uh, well, I'll give you an example. I'm looking for someone for us. I've already brought in someone for Instagram and all our social media and content. And now I'm looking for someone else around that sort of age group. Probably shouldn't say that because they're, because that's what they do. And that, so I think that employment will go up for that sort of age group. That's my opinion. You, you, you just mentioned you're, you're hiring at the moment. Um, yeah. Do you think that in the short term, there'll be a lot of uh, Skype interviews taking place rather than face-to-face -face interviews when people need to fill vacancies? And if so, what advice would you be giving to students? How should they present themselves in a Skype interview? What would you like to see if, yeah. it, just assume one of our students was in, interviewing for one of your jobs, what do you want to see as an employer? Good question. I think, I think, this is, I think there'll be a lot of, well, I know there are a lot of interviews going on at the moment because, you know, there's, um, you obviously, this whole social distancing, you can't get together face to face. I think going forward, it will all be videos. I think they'll bring in, you know, I knew recruitment companies were doing it at the start anyway, and, biz and businesses were doing it at the start. But I think now more, you know, going forward, the world's going to change. You know, you can literally, we can sit on a, uh, um, you can sit on a call for an hour and not move from your office. The costs of doing interviews now are so low. So I think a lot of people will, um, will be doing that going forward. Yeah. Um, what I would want to see, 
it's tough because it depends on the role, but let's just say I'm looking for, for someone in marketing at the moment. Um, I want to see someone who understands what's going on at the moment to the best that they possibly can. I want to see um, confidence in the market at the moment and positivity as well as uh, realism as well. And I think the problem is, is there's a lot of people in marketing and a lot of people going out to the outside world saying, oh, everything's great. Everything's hunky dory. Everything's, you know, positive. We're going to move forward. The world's going to be a better place. And then there's the opposite of the world's changing. It's completely negative and, and so on. And I think we have to be kind of, um, we have to sit in the middle and go, look, it's a, it's a exciting time, but it's also really, it's going to affect everybody in, in, in a way, good or bad. It's going to affect absolutely everybody. So I think so long as people know that I want, that's what I would want. I want people to get them people realistic, but positive. And, you know, so I would, I'd want body language is key for me, body language. And I think not looking into the screen, not using your hands. Um, for me, I can tell whether I want to hire someone just by their body language straight away and the energy that they give off. Brilliant. Let, let's hope we've got some marketing students listening that might want to apply for one of your vacancies at the moment. <laughs> um, another student question, um, different, different areas contribute towards a football club's finances, you know, broadcasting, ticket sales, uh, league positions, things like that. Um, are any of them going to be more important than, than any of the others? Are any going to stand out for you during these difficult financial times? Say, sorry, answer me that question again. I didn't catch the first bit. Yeah, I mean, different areas contribute to clubs' finances, yeah. broadcasting, ticket sales, uh, their league position, things like that. Is any one going to stand out more than others at the moment? I think they're all important, as important as each other. Um, I think you're going to get broadcasting is going to go up, in my opinion. So I think as many, I think that um, because of obviously what's happening on, match tickets are going to come down, so that will cover that. I think um, they're all as important as each other. And I think, I think a lot of clubs will have it, start investing in their own. And, you know, player sales, huge. That's going to be a massive key. So you're going to get a lot of clubs reinvesting in their academies. And I think player sales will be a big part. Um, you're going to get a lot of the, lower Premier League clubs that have money it will help the EFL clubs because that does that make sense? Yeah, but I yeah. think I, I think that every bit of revenue now is extremely important. I don't think they um, they differ from one another. No. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask you, Mitch, one more from my list. Then we've got three really good questions in the chat box that I'm going to dive yeah, into. Yeah, I'm just seeing them, yeah. yeah. Um, what advice would you give to students who are graduating this summer from UCFB that are thinking of starting their own business rather than being employed by someone else? What differences are you seeing in the current climate? Is it a, is it a better time than normal to be your own boss or, or not? What do you think? I think personally, it's an absolutely great opportunity for anybody wanting to start their own business or, or whether you're young, whether you're old. And I think as someone graduating isn't, okay, I'll rephrase that. I don't think there's any better opportunity. I think it's, you know, things are, you need a laptop and a coffee shop. You don't even need a coffee shop. You got your lounge. And with the power of social media, with the power of digitalization, which is what I was talking about before, I personally think is, you know, there's some, there's some amazing opportunities out there. And I think you're going to get a lot of businesses that have been successful that don't know how to pivot slightly and change the way that they're working. So I think younger, the younger generation are going to find extremely great opportunities to solve problems, which businesses that have been successful doing in the past can't. And I think, you know, you talk about financing business, you don't need, you don't need much to finance a business anymore. You've got loans that are really cheap. Um, you've got, you know, you could set up a business with a thousand pound, if that, five hundred pound. You don't even need anything. You know, you hear businesses set up. You know, you look at the last recession we had was two thousand and eight, and it was nowhere near as bad as this. But you look at the companies that were invented with nothing during that time. You know, you had WhatsApp that was invented, uh, with Uber that was invented. These are all things that came up from the recession. I think it's, and they were all set up by younger, the younger generation. And I think it's the same sort of thing. I think there's a massive opportunity. There's a lot of, most businesses are cutting costs and, and downsizing because they can't, um, they can't pivot. And I think now for, for the younger generation, you know, there's, the opportunities are huge. Look at the big companies, see what they can't do. Do it yourself. It won't take much. 
Um, Mitch, um, can I direct you to the, the chat box? I mean, I yeah. know that the other attendees can't see the questions, but perhaps um, if you, there are some good questions that popped into the chat box, and I think a lot of them are from students. Um, do you mind just reading the question yeah. and then giving yeah. your answer? Yeah, I'm just looking at it. Ian's loving a question on the on the in the chat box. Oh, Ian won't leave you alone, but we'll, we'll, we'll answer <laughs> the others first. All right, let's get on to the others. So, as, uh, um, okay, someone's also as a semi-pro uh, professional footballer. How do you find managing both jobs at the same time? Did you prioritise accounting over football? Any advice? Paul, between the two. Good question. I, football was my passion um, and account, at, the, at the time when I first started accountancy, it wasn't my passion. It was more just understanding business. And I think I've always, always made time for football, no matter what. So I've created my business lifestyle through football. Football's my getaway. Some people would use the gym. Some people would use whatever they use. But football's my, it sits, sits in my heart. And I, you know, without football, I would not be able to do what I do. Saying that, as I've got older and as I've progressed and I've seen how we help businesses, it's also become a passion. But so... Honestly, football, it, depends on, it depends on your own per personal circumstances. If you love football, keep it there. Keep it, because it, it will help you progress in, in life. It's not just about playing football. It's about the mental aspect of it. Being in a changing room, being, you know, we've got, you know, we're fortunate to have fans, you know, seeing the fans after having a drink with them, my family come and watch me play, spending time with my family after. It's more what it does for my mental health rather than, rather than anything else. So always, in my opinion, always make time for your second, uh, for, for, for football, for, for any sport, any exercise, anything like that. Lovely, thank you. Do you want to just carry on moving down the questions? Um, why haven't many Premier League teams purchased pandemic insurance? I don't know. Um, you, it's always been the same, same it's, you know, it's talk about Premier League teams and talk about your normal businesses because they are businesses. No one expected this to happen. And I think, you know, the ones that um, have, the ones that, that just thought, you know, who is it? I read something the other day about um, someone who purchased, I oh, was it Wimbledon? Wimbledon purchased, um, Wimbledon purchased pandemic insurance and they're going to make more money than what they would do from, from having Wimbledon on in the first place. I don't know is the honest answer. I just think people haven't budgeted for it. I, I you know, I think no one expected this to happen. There's always been some, you know, Bill Gates putting videos out there, but it's always, well, that's never going to happen. Um, but it has. So I just think it's complete um, ignorance. So, but well, well know, done, who, who, that's all we can say, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, they've just acted in, in they've had good advice and, and so on. Mm. Okay, there's one from David. If you were doing a financial analysis of a club at the moment, what would you include? What main factors would you include at the moment? Well, it's funny you should say that because we actually we were involved in the well the original Bolton takeover, which didn't go to plan. So it's interesting. I was thinking about this this morning. What would we have done differently now to what we done then? Because we had to go and do a whole financial analysis on the whole on, on you know Bolton Wanderers Football Club. The world's, the world's completely fallen off a cliff. So I think it would, my, my main factor that I would want to look at is reserves at the moment. If I was to go right now, right to this, you know, this moment in time, I'd want to go and see how long the club can, can survive without any revenue coming in. That would be my main thing that I would look at now. And then I would look at um, you know, what they, you know, how, how they're going to create revenue streams going forward. Have they got you know, players, what, what's the asset value that they're, they're sitting on? So how many assets, the property, do they own the stadium? Things that they can borrow against. To, to, it's more about survival at the moment to make sure the club can sustain um, and, and survive for a certain period of time. That, that's what I would be looking at right this second. Mitch, good question from Hazel. You know, in this uh, economic sort of hardship time, uh, club or companies um, will look to cut back on certain costs. Do you think this could have an effect on the money they spend on sponsorship in, in football? And, you know, will that, will that put clubs at risk? Yeah, I do think that. I completely think that, which is why I said before, it's all about how well the clubs have been run to rely on that sponsorship. Um, I think you, but it's just as much as you're going to get com uh, companies cutting back on marketing, 
And I think it's the easiest cost to cut. And I think that's the difference between a business that thrives during this time and a business that just shrinks or fails. I think marketing is the first and marketing business development are the first and easiest costs to cut. The ones who push in that direction are the ones who will, um, who will progress in my opinion. And I think if you look at the history, they're the ones who have progressed which is why we're looking for some people in marketing at the moment to, to help us push. And I think that just as much, I think it is a risk because no one knows what's going to happen, but just as much as people are, uh, businesses are cutting back costs, there's also going to be businesses that will use the opportunity to market probably for slightly cheaper and to a much bigger audience. When you think all the games are going to be televised, so I think that there's going to be huge amounts of sponsorship. You might see a slightly different type of sponsorship, but there will be sponsorship. But it is a risk because it, that clubs, you know, they are going to pull out. People are going to pull out. Fair enough. I'm just looking back across to the, the, the Zoom questions that are coming in. Um, one, one of our eminent um, uh, managers at UCFB, Dr. Nick Wilde, just, just learned this myself. He was on BBC London this morning asking how long it would take Spurs to pay off the debt on the, the new stadium. Um, what impact might this have on Tottenham? You know, they're not obviously getting the revenue they're expecting at the moment, knowing that they have an outstanding loan. Nick said 600 million in his, in his text there. Um, what, what, what impact might that have? Yeah, I think this goes down to probably why they were from, uh, try to furlough people in the first place. I think they've probably looked at their figures and thought, Oh my God. Um, I think they may would have made back, they would have got back 350 grand for, for furlough is what I read. And I think you have to think that's where it originated from a bit of panic. Um, they're going to have to find new revenue streams, aren't they? And I think that if any club, I, know, I do actually know someone who's head of technology at Spurs. And I think if anybody are going to do something to create a digital revenue, I think it will be them. So it's going to, of course, affect them. It's good. They're probably, they might have to re-borrow, but it all depends on how long it, this, this, the pandemic um, lasts for. I think, you know, I read, I, I don't know if anybody saw the Chancellor last night. Um, he said that it's going to be a tough three months, but he reckons that, by the end of the year, it actually is not going to be, it's only going to be 6% down or 6.2% down. So I think it's going to cause a huge, the economy is going to, he predicted the economy reducing by 35% over the next quarter, but then coming back to 6% by the end of the year. So I think it all depends on how long it lasts for. Of course, if this lasts for a year, 18 months and, and so on, then of course, I mean, they rely on ticket sales, don't they? So it's, and Spurs are a club to rely on ticket sales. Can I pick you up on that, Mitch? Because um, I, yeah. I was amazed last year when there was a report out saying that the money from, from broadcast is so huge now. At the time, there were more than half of the Premier League clubs could have gone the whole season without opening their doors to fans. They didn't rely on the, the, the ticket sales from the fans. I, I'm a bit of a romantic, but could this mean that the, the football, it should mean football clubs need the fans more than ever now? Yes, they do. Um, but then it's, then it's the whole case of how, you know, do you, as a fan, are you going to want to go and sit in a stadium of, of 60,000 people when people were dying? So I don't know, even if, yeah, you're right, they need the fans, but a fan's going to want to go and buy tickets. So I think ticket sales will go down, but you're, you're absolutely right. I think you're going to get, you know, Amazon, Amazon will probably jump into the frame. You're going to get YouTube already have jumped into it. You're going to get people like that have just got unlimited. Um, they're so liquid that will come in and they will help these clubs survive via broadcasting. Sky, you know, everyone's watching Netflix even. And, you know, they're all, there's so many broadcasting opportunities now where clubs, where, you know, they're so liquid. Mitch, um, I, I think this is another student question. It's a really good one coming in. Uh, women's football. I mean, women's yeah. football is often the poor relation and, and some clubs just sort of, just make token gestures to their to their women's teams um what what needs to be done to support with the women's game at the moment i don't I, well i think the same thing is what you know like the same thing i work with um well we've got mutual connection gary gary lewin who works closely with the arsenal the arsenal ladies and you know i spend a lot of time with gary and you know arsenal women that if i use them as an example because i think um, i think they're a good example to use they're, they're their own. Although they train and everything at Arsenal, they're their own entity. 
you know, they, they bring in their own revenue. Um, I'm sure they get some sort of help from Arsenal themselves, but they have their own costs and everything like that. So I think they'll be treated separately in the same. I think, I think they will need support. And I do think, I really do think that they will get support from their parent clubs. I really do. And I think that um, you'll get a lot of, you know, sponsorship will play a big part in that as well. I think it's the same as every other club and every other team. I do, I do think it will be, um, I do think that the, the answer to your question is yes, I do think that the main club will support all areas of the, of the club. Okay, um, good question coming in on, on the web chat. Uh, do you think there could be a reshuffle in Europe as well as, you know, in, in the UK and EFL? Um, it's saying clubs like Ajax have a good academy um, and, and a more, more strong consistently. Is, is there any impact that you could see happening around Europe? Absolutely. I think it's going to be the same thing. I think you look at teams like Ajax who have an extremely strong academy um, and, you know, they don't, I don't actually know if they've spent money, but, you know, they sell players or they've sold players to, you know, I think the lit went to Barcelona for something silly. Um, uh, yeah, that clubs like that will thrive, I think, in my opinion. I really do. So I think there could be a huge reshuffle in Europe. Okay. Um, I'm just going to give a, give a five minute warning to people that might be adding questions to what we, what we've had so far. I think it's going really well. Um, just, just a sort of more, perhaps a sponsorship related question or marketing related question. Um, By the way, Neil, we've got, we've got this till 12. If you okay, want. no problem. Yeah. Um, if, um, if clubs now obviously need to, to, focus on keeping their supporters engaged. I mean, you mentioned earlier a really good point that some clubs are interacting brilliantly with their fans, others hardly at all. What, what might clubs need to do to not lose those supporters in the longer term? Yeah, and I think it's all about engagement, isn't it? And I think now the way to get through to fans is to offer them, you know, this social media is huge. Um, it is massive. And I think you ha I'm not a marketeer, so I don't know how you do it. But I think that you have to engage them on a digital, on a digital platform. And I don't know whether that's, you know, you would put, you're saying that you look at, there's TV channels that people, that clubs do at the moment, right? Man U TV, um, Chelsea, know, Chelsea yeah. TV. I think there's, a, there's so people are engaging with fans away from the pitch. And I think that needs to happen throughout the whole of football now to engage with fans and personalise things. So even the fans and the players need to become one. The players and the clubs need to make the fans feel really part of that club and to get the support of the fans to help the club. I think everyone's missing football. And I think, I think if, it's, if, it's, if, you, if you engage with your fans um, properly and often and personalise stuff, so you don't, you, know, you don't sit up here and your fans sit down here, like a lot of the Premier League clubs, you're even, you know, you, every, fan's, every fan's thought matters. And I think to do that, you need to do, you know, Zoom calls with fans and get the players on. I don't know, uh, but I do think that you, they need to do a lot more digital content. You know, you've got platforms like YouTube, platforms like YouTube, Zoom, um, Skype, that can allow you, you can, you can connect with thousands of people. I've actually seen clubs like QPR, again, they're one of the clubs we're partnered with, with our broadcasting degree, and QPR have had the manager, Mark Warburton, hosting quiz, quizzes, calling fans, you know, online and, and, and broadcasting it. So that, that's a really good point. Wouldn't it be great if Harry Kane takes five minutes off from his uh, training schedule and, and does a Zoom call with, with fans? That would really, really, really help. And he, he, I've seen him do that on his Instagram. He does Instagram Live where he does, but they don't do it as a club. And I think it would be a great thing for, you know, someone like Harry Kane to, I don't know, even if he hosted a quiz with all the fans and the winner got a season ticket. Next, like things like that would be a great, great little marketing tool. We're doing, um, we're doing a quiz for all our clients, actually. We've got, um, talking of online digital marketing, if you like, with uh, the beast from The Chase. He's hosting it for us, which is, you know, something similar to give something and keep people engaged with what it is you're doing. 
great idea. Um, Mitch, I'm going to ask you a little bit about um, physical and mental well-being. So, mm. you know, you, you from a, a mental well-being side of things, you're an athlete, you know, and I know you've represented uh, Great Britain in the, in the Maccabee Games, and I know that you've played play semi-pro. How do you cope mentally with what's going on as an athlete because you love to play football when you can't yeah. and and also how do you cope as a business owner making sure your staff are okay mentally that that's one thing and then and then perhaps tell us a little bit about what we might be doing physically there's quite a lot of um exercise uh videos and classes on tv at the moment when i spoke to you last week i interrupted yeah. your training session because yeah. you're a you're a hard trainer anything for you i've yeah. been reduced to cycling around the park with my son that's the limit for me but can i just ask you to focus on physical and mental well-being at this moment please i mean that's massive to me that for me is one of my biggest priorities and for the first two weeks, first week, let's say first week, I really struggled, you know, to, we, we train non-league twice a week, Tuesday, Thursdays, play Saturdays. Um, and you know, when you're, when you're so active and when you're around a team, um, a dressing room, which is, you know, normally upbeat when, especially when you're winning or even when you're losing, you've always got people there and all of a sudden it goes and you're stuck within the same four walls. It's tough. It really plays a big part. And I think that the most important thing for me is to, you know, make sure that, you, you know, I go out for runs. I'll, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you my exercise program because I think that's quite a good start to let you know kind of you can, what. You can upset me. Go on, upset me and tell me what you're doing. <laughs> Firstly, obviously, with training and you're missing out. So I, I do... I'm like, I've got a sports scientist who I know really well who writes me a program um, to keep me fit. Simple as that. Um, and that's also for my head as well. Because when I'm, when I'm, you know, I work during the day, I look after people during the day, I'm on my laptop, speaking to people the whole time. It's important you get your own time to focus on, you know, keeping your heart healthy and keeping your head, getting space in your head. Because I think without creating space in your head, you can't make key decisions for the business or anything in your life. If you've got loads of thoughts and exercise for me, gets rid of those thoughts. So, I, I do a circuit every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. It's about a 40 minute circuit. Anyone wants it, I'll happily send it to you. It's very tough. On a Tuesday and Thursday, I'll do a half an hour spinning or a bike ride. And on a Saturday, I'll do a five kilometer run. And that's still not enough for me. I mean, I, I'm not saying because I'm fit, I'm saying for my head, you know, it's, the, it's so important. It's just so important. And also eating eating well, diet as well, Neil. And I think, you know, it's all, it's all being, it's all good and well people, you know, after new year, oh, my new year's resolution is to eat well and, and, and get fit. Now is probably the most important time than ever. You've got an opportunity to, to make healthy food. You've got an opportunity to go for a run on your own with your headphones in or without your headphones in. You've got a bike, you've got an opportunity. You don't have to talk to anybody. You don't, it's a great opportunity to reset and to, to keep fit. But mental health for me, it's something that has affected me in the past um, five, six, seven years, seven years ago, where I really struggled because, you know, going back to the same question, football work, football work, I was still going to be a pro, but I still wanted to go and, um, you know, have, have my own business. Exercise was like, is so key for my mental health. You know, I'll, I'll be, you know, as you can imagine, as a business owner, we've got so many decisions to make and so many clients to speak to on the phone who, who are having issues and have got problems. And it becomes quite draining and it becomes quite hard and it's difficult to not take it personally. And, and I think that, you know, you go and do a half an hour workout or for, all of a sudden you're focusing on other things and it goes and you come back completely refreshed. So I would urge anybody to do something every single day um, doesn't have to be difficult if you you know if you just do something even if it's a, a a 20 minute walk do something and and focus on eating the right foods because so i think eating diet plays a key part in mental health as well absolutely i'll pick up with one additional point there i was fortunate enough to witness a, a course we do for our students it's called WAC 2 it's leadership training in the lake district it's actually run mostly by former sas officers and they are hugely inspirational as you are today um and and the best bit of advice that one of them said was 
you you decide what you put in your mouth you choose what goes in your mouth so you need to think very carefully before you pick up something you know is bad for you and, and eat it and it is it can be as simple as that i know that might be easier said than done but i just thought it was a good bit of advice that you just need to be a bit a bit mentally tough and but, decide what is going to go but in Neil, there's mind. been days there's been days where you know to do a workout it's not like I, I go to the gym you literally have to walk from one room to another so it's been tough it's, i find it harder to 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 do it but you have to do it. I set myself a target every single day. I have to do this. I set it in the morning. I say, right, this is your work. I look at the program. I'm like, right, six o'clock or five o'clock. Once you finish, this is what you're going to do. And I don't accept no for an answer. And in my head, I've got voices. No, don't worry. You don't need to do it today. But I make myself do it. And honestly, it's, it's in my opinion, that was the, that's something you have to do to beat those negative voices in your head. Because once you've beaten one, you'll beat, you know how to beat them all. Mm. Mitch, completely changing subject. Uh, yeah. Two of our Etihad graduates are, are making big strides in the world of esports. They're esports commentators. Um, do you think this will have any impact on esports um, with what's going on in the lockdown? I know there are more tournaments going on. Our local club, Leighton Orient, ran, ran a tournament. Have you come into when you talk, wait, When you're talking esports, you're talking like online so, yeah we're talking mate FIFA. i mean for our purposes let's talk fifa because Perfect. we're talking about yeah. football i could talk about fifa all day long i love yeah. the game yeah but do you think esports from a business point of view as as well is that is that gonna change that's massive I, i've got a, i've got a client actually who um a couple of years ago are focusing on esports literally focusing on esports sponsorship for esports i think it's massive because you know especially now like i said before everything's going digital the reach the online reach is huge. You can have, um, if you wanted to, you could have 20 million people watching a game of football. And I think that everybody's sitting in their front rooms playing PlayStation. I'm guilty. Um, I am very good at FIFA. So if anyone wants to play esports, they can uh, feel free to hit me up. But, um, but no, I, I definitely, I think, it's, I think that it could be huge. And I think it will be huge. They do on, I, I, I see an online FIFA tournament every year, I think. Um, where they get hundreds of thousands of entries. We, we, we have um, an eSports society, and I'm, I've just checked the attendees. Ilias is, is not online, but he runs our eSports society. He's a young man who's, again, he's going to have a big career and make a lot of money in eSports. I, I think I'll connect him to you at, at some point uh, with, with your background. Um, just literally one or two more questions, Mitch, and we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, yeah. Again, on the chat box, somebody has asked if you know if there's any truth in the rumour that championship owners might go into a group administration to save wage dilemmas. Is something like that? could happen i don't know um but i think in any i don't i i think if they're going to do something like that it will be to get support i don't think they'll actually follow through with it and my i don't think they can follow through with it so i think that the whole the football world will just just go completely mental i, I think too many clubs would fold so i think what you're going to get is they're just putting up a fight and a committee if you like to get support from the probably the bigger clubs, the, the, the Premier League, and maybe the, the PFA as well. Absolutely. Um, Mitch, we've been going almost 50 minutes. I can see that the question inbox has dried up a little bit. Um, can I ask you for perhaps some last bit of advice for you? What message would you give to our students during this time in, in terms of encourage them to carry on as a wrap up for us? I think everyone, every, every business owner that I've spoken to in the past have always said to me, um, do you know what? I wish I could have a pause button so I can do all the things that I need to do. And I think what, you know, sometimes you have to be careful what you wish for, but right now there's a pause button, which is what everyone that well, most people have wanted. So I think use this opportunity to um, learn new skills, uh, read learn, and, and really focus on, on your mental health, keep fit and use it as an opportunity to, to, to go to the outside world because I think you know I think a lot of people on here are going to am I right Neil are going to go out to the start new businesses maybe go and look to get employment definitely yeah I think now's the perfect opportunity for people your age use it go approach business owners if someone that's a, you know, if someone came to me and proactively and said look I know it this is about your business I think you've got a great opportunity here I can help you do this 
I, you know, I'm hiring them straight away because that's what I want to see. To so use this opportunity to take a step back, learn new skills, and really, really focus on yourself. And and if anyone's starting a new business, absolutely great opportunity. And I'm happy to help anybody if if anyone wants to get in touch. Brilliant. I'm just going to remind everybody that your email address is Mitch M I T C H at Nordens N O R D E N S dot co dot uk. That's right, isn't it, Mitch? Yeah, that's yeah. right. There's, a, there's another question. Do you want me to quickly answer it? Yes, please. Yes, I didn't see it. Go on, go, go for it. If you have a hard time in your job, how do you overcome it? Do you have a physical or mental method or is every situation different? Every situation is different. Um, I firstly have people around me that I can talk to all the time. I've got people that I talk to about different things that I trust. So I always run things by them um, just to to get it off. So it's important that you get your thoughts off your, off your head or off your chest. Then I always do exercise, always do exercise. If I'm, if I'm overwhelmed with having a hard day, you know, I'll, I'll go to the gym. I know Paula who works with me is on the, who's listening into this call as well. You know, it'll become 1130 during the day. I would have had the, a really, really difficult morning. I'll just pick up my bag and go to the gym because I know that I'm going to come back in a completely different place. Um, so, I always try and do ex talk to people and also exercise. Um, they are my two main uh, main things that I would do if I've had a hard time. Excellent, yeah. Mitch. Um, I'm gonna gonna wrap it up there. Um, I'm just which team? Ah, uh, oh, just a quick question: Who are you playing for at the moment, semi pro wise? Who are you who are you with? Well, the season's just been uh, told that we're finished, but I've been with Gray's Athletic for the last um, for the last couple of seasons. Okay, no problem. Um, I think you've gained a few fans this morning, um, Mick. Mitch, I, I can't thank you enough for all your honesty this morning and your opinions that have been really, really useful. Um, I, I, I must, you know, must get you up to Manchester when all this is all, all over, and we'll get you in at Wembley again. Um, I, I want to tell everyone who's listening. Mitch has done this as a, as a favour to me. It's a, a huge favour. He's given up his time. Uh, he could have been exercising. Just think, we've stopped him from exercising. Oh, I've got that uh, at half six today. Oh, he's got it. He's got it in his, on his to do list, of course. Um, we, we did peak at just over sixty participants at one time this morning, and and virtually all of them have stayed with us. That's quite an achievement. Um, so I'm going to thank everybody that's listened, everyone that asked a question. All the questions were excellent. Uh, thank you for your time this morning thank you to mitch and mitch hopefully we'll speak to you again soon thank you very much sounds good thanks neil thanks for having okay, me okay bye for now everybody thank you for joining us